the abandoned Russian fort that once housed a deadly research facility. It's 1899, and in a mysterious fort just off the coast of St. Petersburg, Russian scientists are conducting probing experiments on animals that could well kill them. And if the test subjects do ultimately perish, the researchers will have no choice but to burn the bodies on the same site. For you see, the threat posed to humans as a result of these investigations is also very real. But just why were the scientists in that remote building? And how did they come to be embarking on potentially deadly work there? Well, interestingly, Fort Alexander I was named after the Russian emperor who ruled a czar from 1801 until 1825. And initially, the stronghold was built to protect the imperial Russian capital of St. Petersburg from attacks in the Baltic Sea. At that time, you see, the city was vulnerable to naval assault along the Gulf of Finland, the eastern arm of the Baltic. What's more, the Gulf of Finland was a key part of Russian strategy after the founding of St. Petersburg in 1703. The city's importance only increased in 1713, too, when it took the place of Moscow as Russia's capital. And apart from a short break in the 18th century, St. Petersburg retained that honor until 1918. Back in 1824, though, a devastating flood of the river Neva swept away the city's largely wooden and earthwork defenses. In fact, the deluge was the biggest in St. Petersburg's history. Owing to that catastrophe, then, Tsar Nicholas I decided it was time for a new protective structure. And this time around, they would be built to last, in stone. Yet, although plans for the fort were drawn up some three years after the flood, construction didn't actually start until 1838. Alexander wasn't completed and brought into service until 1845 either. Then, toward the end of the 19th century, locals gave the building a new sinister name, the Plague Fort. We'll explain why the fortress came to be called this a little later. But first, let's take a more detailed look at the structure's history. As we've heard, Fort Alexander I's purpose was to protect St. Petersburg from assault by sea. And the city's location on the shores of the Gulf of Finland made it particularly vulnerable to such attacks. The Gulf of Finland lies at the eastern extreme of the Baltic Sea, with Finland on its northern shore, Estonia meanwhile lies to the south. And somewhat inconveniently, St. Petersburg is located at the point where the river Neva runs into the Gulf. So to protect the Russian capital from maritime assault, a string of fortress strongholds was built in the 19th century. In fact, a first generation of forts was built in the 18th century as a way to protect St. Petersburg from Sweden. Russia and Sweden had waged war against each other for centuries, with three conflicts in particular taking place during the 1700s. But as we've mentioned, these 18th century defenses were badly damaged by the Great Flood of 1824. As well as Fort Alexander, the 19th century defenses of St. Petersburg include Forts Rizbank, Peter I, Kronschult, and Constantine. These structures also provided a defensive curtain for the important naval base of nearby Kronstadt on Kotlin Island and the extravagantly named Louis Bartholomé Cobinier d'Artistes de Garnac drew up the original 1827 plans for Alexander. Mind you, de Garnac was also known by the Russians rather more simply as Lev Livovich Carbonier. He had previously been responsible for the blueprints of an earlier Gulf of Finland fortress, Fort Citadel, which was later to be named Fort Peter I. Tragically, though, de Garnac died in 1836 before the construction of Alexander even got started. Incidentally, the engineer who took over de Grignac's plans was a Russian of French heritage who also had two names, Maurice Gugovich Destrem and Jean-Antoine Maurice. In any case, he updated de Grignac's proposals, and with the result being that building works finally got underway in 1838. Russian engineer Mikhail von der Vied took charge of the fort's new construction, and the project was certainly an ambitious one. You see, the scheme didn't just involve building a fort, it also entailed constructing a man-made island to put the fort on. Strikingly, construction workers achieved this feat by driving no fewer than 5,535 piles, each 40 feet long, into the seabed. That's right, these piles form the basis for layers of sand, concrete blocks, and slabs of granite. Now, the fort itself, which measures about 295 feet by 196 feet, was constructed with thick red brick walls encased in granite. And from above, the building has an incomplete oval shape that can be likened to a kidney bean. But don't let the rather benign comparison fool you, as the fort was armed to the teeth and ready for action should any attack come. Two land-based forts, Constantine and Peter I, each situated on one side of Alexander, completed the harbor mouth's defenses. 
but let's get back to Alexander itself the magnificent stronghold had had a floor space of almost 54,000 square feet and it could accommodate up to 1,000 troops and Alexander's defense capability was certainly formidable the forts walls for example incorporated 103 embrasures or portholes for cannons while another 34 cannons could be deployed on the forts roof but for all this daunting firepower the truth is that troops at Alexander never fired off a shot in anger still that's not to say that building Alexander had been a waste of time instead the forts power as a potent defensive weapon came from its qualities as a deterrent when Russia fought against Britain France and the Ottomans in the Crimean War for example Alexander proved its worth and Alexander was made all the more daunting as a defense resource through the deployment of innovative new technologies in 1853 German Russian engineer Mortis von Jacobi had invented a mine designed for use at sea the device would be attached to the sea floor with an anchor with a cable running from the mine to a power cell on land and it would be the cell that detonated the charge a total of 31 pounds of gunpowder as it happens the Russians were the first to deploy examples of Jacobi's invention in the sea around Fort Alexander and another type of mine was also used first by the Russians in the Gulf of Finland these were chemical contact mines which had been developed by the Swede Emanuel Nobel he was the father of Alfred Nobel who set aside some of his fortune to establish the prizes that bear his name and so it was in 1854 during the Crimean War that the British Royal Navy decided to probe the Russians the Brits thus sailed into the Gulf of Finland toward the maritime defenses of Kronstadt and st. Petersburg the fleet's commander Admiral Sir Charles John Napier decided against an attack however upon seeing the forts and minefields in the vicinity then in 1855 another Royal Navy squadron this time accompanied by French ships sailed towards Kronstadt on this occasion mind you the objective was to firstly clear the minefields using small steam-powered ships but the mission which was led by Vice Admiral Sir Richard Saunders Dundas was not a success and again Fort Alexander would play a key role you see although Dundas boats managed to clear a few mines this came at the expense of four of his vessels what's more the operation would push the boats to within the range of cannons mounted on the forts including those at Alexander and since Dundas subsequently abandoned his attempt to sail on Kronstadt Alexander again proved its worth as an efficient deterrent after those ultimately uneventful incidents of 1854 and 1855 Fort Alexander was only to be put on alert twice more firstly in 1863 there was a perceived danger that conflict might be rekindled between Russia and the British ultimately though this came to nothing then there was the Russo Turkish War from 1877 to 1878 but no attempt was made on Kronstadt during that conflict either and as the 19th century progressed new developments in gunnery much diminished the military importance of forts like Alexander the rifled barrel which came into artillery use in the mid 19th century was one such innovation previously cannons had been smooth bored thanks to rifled barrels however shells could be fired at much higher speeds invariably the higher velocities meant that projectiles could penetrate harder targets including fortress walls like those of Alexander sadly then the fort was no longer an impregnable defense and proof of its newfound vulnerability came from an experiment in Sweden their Vaxholm fortress which was similar in strength to Alexander was deliberately shelled from rifled artillery by the Swedish Navy as you may have already guessed the modern guns quickly shattered the fortress walls so as the 19th century drew to a close Russia's military commanders now regarded Fort Alexander as a redundant resource as a consequence then it was put into use as an ammunition storage dump in 1896 the authorities even formally decommissioned Alexander alongside two other forts but that was not the end of Alexander's story far from it in fact unlikely as it may seem it was a medical breakthrough that would provide the next chapter in Fort Alexander's life in particular in 1894 scientist Alexandra Emil Jean Yerson would identify the pathogen that caused the bubonic plague Yerson was born in Switzerland but later took French nationality and lived from 1863 to 1943 yet Yerson was in fact only the code discoverer of the bacterium that caused the much feared plague yes although the microorganism was ultimately called Yersinia pestis after the Swiss man Japanese researcher Kirisato Shibasaburo made the same breakthrough and interestingly both scientists achieved the feat in Hong Kong just days apart fortunately for Yerson he had something of a march on Shibasuro 
as he had found that the same bacterium was present in both infected rodents and humans. Indeed, this link paved the way for the discovery that the plague was transmitted from rodents to humans via flea bites. Prompted by this revelation, the Russian government set up the Commission on the Prevention of Plague Disease. The commission was also given the task of carrying out further research into the bacteriology of the potentially deadly illness. But as the work involved was highly dangerous – it involved contact with pathogens that caused the plague, after all – scientists needed somewhere isolated with a high level of security to conduct experiments. Where better than Fort Alexander? Therefore, in January 1897, the commission decided that Fort Alexander would be the location of its brand new research facility. Once there, it would operate under the auspices of Russia's Imperial Institute of Experimental Medicine. So in the two years that followed, essential work was carried out to transform the fort into a research center. For example, the fort was fitted with laboratories, some with containment facilities to minimize the dangers of working with lethal bacteria. Additionally, there would be a stable that could house 16 horses, and these were the animals that would be experimented on. An incineration facility was also included to safely dispose of any horses that ultimately died. But it didn't stop there. Fort Alexander was also equipped with a comprehensive science library, with noted Russian philanthropist Duke Alexander Petrovich of Oldenburg kindly footing much of the bill. As well as being exceptionally wealthy, the Duke was himself a medical doctor. In 1899, then, everything was ready at the fort, meaning the important research could commence. Now, intriguingly, doctors and scientists some accompanied by their families lived at the site itself. This was just as well as the only means of getting to the fort was by a small steamer that was appropriately named Microbe. Yet while access to Alexander was closely controlled, there were facilities for visitors, even conferences. Regardless of the main focus for the scientists at Alexander was producing serum and vaccines to combat the plague, and they did this by infecting horses in the hope of immunizing them. Therefore, the horse's blood could potentially be used as the basis for vaccines. And as the years went by, the laboratory also searched for inoculations against fatal diseases such as tetanus, typhus, cholera, and scarlet fever. Unfortunately, it seems that biosecurity was not all that it might have been at Fort Alexander. Certainly, the dangers of working with these deadless infectious bacteria proved all too real. You see, there were three cases of plague among the staff on the isolated island in 1904 and 1907, and tragically, those outbreaks would claim the lives of two researchers. By terrible coincidence, one of those who died was the director of the center in 1904, Dr. V. I. Turchinevov Vizhnikovich. The other man to perish was Dr. Emanuel F. Schreiber, who had fallen ill in 1907. Schreiber had diagnosed himself as suffering with pneumonic plague, a disease that's nearly always fatal, and so it proved. He was dead within three days of contracting the condition. Ultimately, then, both of the dead men's bodies were burned in the island's incinerator. And although this move was made to avoid any risk of further infection, it could very well have caused the men's families great pain. A third doctor, L. V. Podlevsky, also contracted the infection but survived thanks to a vaccine developed at the fort. All in all, it's little wonder that the fortress research lab earned the name of Plague Island. Then it was in 1917, during Russia's cataclysmic communist revolution, that the laboratory's work was brought to an end. The project at Alexander was now taken over by other labs in Saratov, St. Petersburg, and Moscow, with the result being that Fort Alexander was now redesignated as a mere storage facility by the Russian Navy. In 1983, the Navy abandoned Alexander altogether, removing all fixtures and fittings that could be transported. After that, the fort seems to have been left to its own fate although it reportedly became a popular venue for illegal raves toward the end of the 1990s and into the 2000s. Plans for a $43 million renovation that were mooted in 2007 also seem to have come to nothing. So today, this monumental piece of military and medical history lies abandoned and empty. And while some travel websites claim that tour groups do visit the island, specifics are hard to come by. Unless a wealthy entrepreneur eventually invests in the fort then, it will stand as a reminder of the brave doctors and scientists who work to fight deadly disease.